So hi and welcome to Your Irish Connection where we're having chats about how we do these Irish spirituality things with myself Laura O'Brien and this month we are talking to Cordelia Murphy and we're recording this in July for our live session that goes out to our community mailing list and if you're watching this at a later date you can hit subscribe below and join up to our mailing list and you can have access to the live version too, like a month, a month and a half before anybody else gets it. So yay for that. <laughs> so welcome Cordelia. Um, you are very, very welcome to, uh, oh my goodness. I'm just seeing um, your picture here and it's up big on my screen and I know that house. You were in Roscommon when you did that, weren't you? I was, yes. That photograph, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know that that is, house. <laughs> which is why I did that. <laughs> My friend used to live in that house. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, so when were you in, wait, we go back here. When were you in um, Roscommon? When were you in Ireland? Um, I was in Ireland in 2017. 2017. Um, March 2017. And was that your first trip? It was. My first and only so far. So far. <laughs> and um, when and where did your interest in Irish spirituality begin? You know, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, it's kind of like hard too, because it's like, how far back do you go? Yeah. Like, do you go back into spirituality in general and that back? you know or do you go back and like say irish spirituality specifically well irish spirituality specifically but if you want to kind of go into like if there's interesting kind of spiritual background before that then that's fine too if you need the context but... mm, totally I, I just like i'm just mm -hmm. like it's it's a hard question in some yeah. ways like irish spirituality for me like more more specific irish spirituality really i think happened in 2008 uh, when i had a dream with the great queen um who decided uh to um essentially say hey um you should come join me <laughs> um and uh i accepted without really accepting right accepted without really accepting what does that look like um that looks like the fact that i don't remember me accepting but i know i did <laughs> right. um so it's it's like it's like the pitch happened like hey blah, blah, blah. you know it's like somebody selling you something right uh -huh. like, i know i know you know and, and, <laughs> you know at a booth or something like that mm -hmm. and like somebody selling you something and like i don't remember saying yes i'm going to join i remember having the intention of saying yes like i'm sold mm -hmm. but i don't i don't remember that process at all and or any sort of introduction it's just like yeah <laughs> Yeah, and I've said it to you before. It's like she kind of she kind of swoops in and she's just like, "Oh, you're useful. I'll have you." <laughs> and then, exactly. As you say, you get the pitch. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, okay. So, so once that happened, I mean, you could add a bit of context there. So, were you yeah. spiritually inclined already at that point? And uh, yes. So yeah, no, definitely. I mean, context is like key here mm -hmm. i mean because so like um my early years in college and stuff like that so like my first kind of experience uh spirituality was in like a an anglican christian church i grew up in new orleans um but i went to like an episcopalian uh, church and so there was like this hymn that had uh what ended up, ended up being uh what ended up i ended up finding out is a roman religion uh revival or roman religion survival um phrase Kyrie Elison. Right. Um and so and Roman state religion, mind you. Um and so I I ended up doing in college and university classics and classical civilization. Mm. Um and I really focused on like Roman religion and um really just Gaul and Rome. And so it's like I was I at that point like I had really gotten into Gaul and Rome. Um, as like in the interconnections between them. So I was already kind of, I mean, I was like different than Irish, um, certainly, but you know, in some ways, similar. Um, you know, because again, a shared language eventually, you know, back yeah. in the day. Yeah. Um, 
So, and it, it's like, and so I was already kind of primed, you know, I think in a lot of ways by those experiences. So, yeah. And then when, um, so when Irish spirituality or, or the Morgan particularly um, came on your radar, how did you practically go about getting started? So did you look at books or courses or events or were there people you met or, you know, like from there to here, what's been your kind of path with resources and networking and community and that kind of thing? Well, that's an interesting thing. It's, it's one of those things where like the, Okay, so at that time, um, at that time, I, there was a connection for me between, like, I, there was a lot of other things going on for me, and so it wasn't something that I could necessarily practically, like, do anything about. Mm. It was just like, okay, I'm here, I will do whatever I need to do. Um, so I spent a lot of years just kind of knowing that I had that connection, but not really necessarily connecting with it. Um, you know, or doing much about it. Mm. Um, I mean, in part because she didn't really tap me on the shoulder and tell me to do anything else. <laughs> um, you know, but it, because again, you know, uh, who wants to engage? Like, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, I mean, also like, I think, and, and part of that is, is, you know, has to do with like other circumstances around my life in terms of like, you know, other spiritual stuff that was happening to me. And like, um, you know, because at the time, it was like there, there was this, I'm trying to explain it, but also not um, take a ton of time. Yeah. <laughs> because I could take hours with this kind of yeah. explanation. So, okay. So at the time there was, I had to make a choice between, um, uh, you know, I was given like, hey, do you want to come join this group? Um, or do you want to join this other group? And, um, you know, the, and it was kind of one of those things where if I didn't join, it would not be a fun time for me. Mm. Like I had to join to get something that I wanted, um, to, you know, get some access to some things in, uh, in research land that I wanted, you know, that sort of dynamic. And that um, wasn't an Irish group. That was different spirituality, no, was it? Completely different. Mm. Yeah. And so, and that, that kind of access and that kind of like, and also like, frankly, I think that there was a lot of like um, uh, toxic dynamics going on. So I don't necessarily want to go into it a ton, but mm -hmm. the idea is, is that it was like, there was um, a lot of drama around that for me. And so it was like the Irish stuff was always like kind of in the background to that drama that was going on. Mm. And um, so it was kind of one of those things where, okay, I have this connection, but I do not have the capacity to take care of it at all. Hmm. Um, and it's kind of like, so what I did um, at the time is I joined a bunch of like email lists, that sort of thing. And um, I joined a bunch of email lists, um, uh, like the inboss list and a bunch of others. Um, and uh, just kind of research Celtic reconstruction and that sort of thing, which is something that I've been interested in, um, you know, pretty much ever since I essentially heard about it after uh, the, uh, my Gallo-Roman kind of mm. reason. Yeah. You know, sort of thing. And so it was like, um, and oh, some further context. I was in grad school at the time. And so part of why, um, part of why, I, like, this was, and I was also kind of in the middle of transition, mm. uh, transitioning as a trans person in okay. the middle of this more and all. So like, there's way tons of things going. So it's like grad school, transition, and toxic people. And it's like, so the Morgan came to you at a time of um, change and chaos. That that really, I'm shocked. <laughs> I'm really shocked. I'm true, and like, oh uh, yeah. I mean, and, and there were other, you know, Irish deities around, you know, who had some interest in um, the Dacta and that sort of thing. Um, but again, it wasn't the right time. Mm. And, that's, and that's the other thing that's, that's kind of, you know, about that is like, it, it's, it's constant, you know, in my life as like a factor, but it's only in the past few years that it's been really big. Mm. And when, um, when you did pick it up, so you were on the email lists and mm -hmm. presumably like interacting maybe online. I know you don't really, you don't really do Facebook much, but, um, so I'm a total lurker. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, do, I mean, I, I, 
I don't do Facebook much, mostly because I'm, I'm just like, you know, writing on my phone is annoying. Yeah. And like, I'm not, you know, and I do a lot of other things. So yeah, um, I used to do Facebook a lot more. So my Facebook, um, and has a different last name than, than the last name for somebody here, mostly to prevent casual searching from job. Yeah. People, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so the, the thing about this though, is that the thing about these different groups is like, I'm just lurking online and like reading what they're saying and that sort of stuff. Um, and I ended up hitting on um, Alexi Kondoratif's mm. um, work um, because I had kind of read some of the Proto-Indo-European stuff and he was kind of in that vein too. Mm. I don't know if you're terribly familiar with that. I um, have his Celtic Rituals book. Um, yeah. It, it was really interesting. It actually came out, I believe, mm-hmm. the same year as my first book came out. Yeah. And I remember actually my mom coming up to me yeah. <laughs> with a copy of it saying, yeah. she, she, basically, um, she basically told me that I didn't need to bother writing my book because somebody was already writing it. <laughs> somebody had already written it. And I was like, oh, well, thanks, mom. Um, um, your book is better. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, just saying. I mean, and I have a copy of it under this monitor right here. <laughs> well, that was a long time ago. It was only 25 when I wrote that book. So yeah, um, this, sorry, just for anybody who's not familiar, this is um, Irish Witchcraft from an Irish Witch, which came out in 2004, I think, or 2005. Um, but yeah, when, like, the reason that I, that I wrote my book was because there wasn't anybody Irish so there was yeah. nothing, I mean, there was, yeah. I said it multiple times, it was freaking DJ Conway and Edane McCoy and all that bollocks. Mm-hmm. But, um, but there was nothing actually like authentically Irish. There was no Irish voices. Nobody in Irish paganism had published except for like Janet and Stuart Farrar, who were English um, and had come over to live in Ireland for, you know, a very long time before. But they weren't practicing a, a native spirituality. Um, pretty much at all at that stage anyway. Um, so it was very, you know, very traditional Wicca focused, the, the stuff that they were publishing. So um, there were a couple of Druids working and, and all the rest of it around, but everybody was very disconnected. And it was basically, I was trying to figure out Irish stuff and I had no help. And I was like, well, surely there are other people. <laughs> like <this." laughs> So it's that old thing is, you know, if you can't find the book you need, then you have to write it, you know? Yeah. Um, so that was anyway, but when I picked up um Kondratiev's book, um Is that how you say it? I don't well, that's how I say it. I don't know. Um, okay. All right. That's fine. Maybe I my pronunciation could be wrong, but I'm I'm kinda going for like an Eastern European ear to it because we have a yeah. lot of like Polish and Russian and um Czechs that live here. Yeah. So um but yeah, I could have that pronunciation wrong. Apologies if I do. No. Um, I, I, I'm questioning myself right now <laughs> because I'm like, I don't know how to pronounce this. I'm just. <laughs> well, one thing I found actually, you know, just on interesting mm-hmm. surname pronunciations or first name pronunciations is I would have obviously an, an, an ear for Irish and, um, you know, Celtic language pronunciation, but also then just from proximity then from a lot of the European uh, languages you know um, mm-hmm. surnames and, and things that would be common or first names but what I have found is um, a lot of US people with those names or surnames don't pronounce it the same way or don't pronounce it the way I would expect them to so something kind of got lost in in translation or the language here evolved or whatever you know yeah and um, so I've been caught with that a few times so um, I'm always a little bit wary of it um, cause I, I just, I hate the thought of getting somebody's name wrong, <laughs> Yeah, you know, but anyway, um, yeah, the, I, I loved the book with the whole point of this ramble. Sorry. I loved the book, but, um, it was very disjointed for me because I'm so Irish specific, you know, like even yeah. Scottish stuff is outside my remit, you know, yeah. people are like expecting me to do Welsh and I'm like, nope. <laughs> it's Irish all the way I have one lifetime and I have a lot of shit to learn <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm narrowing my focus here you know so yeah, yeah so that kind of flick in between and and it's it, it it honestly it kind of annoyed me a little bit because um 
like this kind of overarching, like a lump in all the Celtic languages and lump in all the Celtic traditions, like they're, they're very different. And I know from the totally. outside looking in, you know, it can maybe, it can, it can look like one kind of lump of stuff, but that's really not how it works over here. No. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. So I did enjoy the book and, and I, I really like parts of it and, and I learned stuff from, from various bits of it, but, um, yeah that would be my my review on it so i i went ahead and i wrote my book anyway <laughs> and, and my mother be damned <laughs> <laughs> well and and for me it was like reading the apple branch and reading these sorts of things like it it, it made sense like it it kind of i feel like it informed me but it didn't necessarily speak to me mm, yeah. you know what i mean it's like um how do we put this I, so i let me i, I want to you know, so there's this like basic Celtic deity types on um, imbass.org that I found mm -hmm. via the Wikipedia article. And, you know, if you, if you read his writing, just that that's available on the internet, and I'll put it in the chat. Um, I mean, it's more in many ways, it's way more Roman mm. than it's way more Roman than like anything Irish. Yeah. You know, he talks about like the Celtic Jupiter. And, you know, while this was really comfortable for me, at the same time, it was also like, well, this is way more Roman. Mm. And it didn't really give me, you know, a ton of sense of things. So, like, reading his work outside of, like, his books, you know, was, was like this, uh, it was kind of, it definitely reminded me very much of the proto-Indo-European people. Yeah. Like, um, you know, Bruce Lincoln and so on. Um, where, you know, you're kind of stretching to get somewhere. Um, and that, you know, it's like, now, I guess the important thing to understand is like, I was deeply and profoundly like attracted to Rome and Roman culture. Like I, 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 I felt a calling there. And so like, I, in going into it and in, into, in university and like studying it, like I really got into it deeply in like, and so, it, it, and so reading this, I'm like, okay, you're using Rome to try to understand, you know, uh, the, Gal the Gallic stuff. I get that. But at the same time, you need to understand what the Gallic stuff is outside of Rome. Mm. And it's like, it, and so it's like, I'd, I'd, and so when I read the Apple Branch and Celtic Ritual, it, it informed, I, the only thing that really stuck with me I guess that is really what I'm trying to say is that is the history in it of the Irish people. Um, you know, in part because like it didn't talk about colonialism, it didn't talk about racism and that sort of thing. Like when I go back and reread it, that's like, yeah. that's blazing and obvious to me. But, and at the time, like it, well, I guess it included colonialism to a certain extent. But, and at the time for me, like, that's the only thing that really like stuck with me besides like maybe the light in the dark here hmm. um and like that sort of thing hmm. and so like i i read it and i got started but it didn't hit yeah um and i guess when you know and so when you're talking about like practically getting started like for me you're looking for something that speaks to you that speaks hmm. to your heart hmm. that speaks to like your core emotions hmm. and like willing and brings up that that like tearful moment of of not quite flooded emotion mm. um that uh and maybe i mean it's different for other people i'm sure but that's like no um, and I'm, I'm curious what did that for you um like was there a book or an event or like where um, did that start for you because that's ooh. that that's really the heart of it for me like i mean you know like my my tagline, if you like, is authentic connection to Ireland. Yeah. You know, and that that you know that reads very well on screen, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But that is so coming from my heart and soul. Yeah, and it's it's at the root of everything I do, everything I write, everything I talk about, everything I teach. Every time I do a guided tour, it it is I. I want people to feel this connection to Ireland that I feel that, and that's what you're talking. That's I, I believe, sorry, if I'm, if I'm no, putting words fine. in your mouth, but that's what I'm relating to. And what you just said there of, um, 
you know, that, that kind of welling up of, of feeling and emotion. And, I, and I'm not talking about, you know, wandering around the island fucking crying my head off or anything. No. It's the, it's, it's that outpouring of, of just spirit energy or connection or whatever it is that's, that's not just coming from me. It's actually coming back on a loop as well, you know, so. And for me, like, okay, so three things. Mm. Um, for me, it, it was one of those things where I, okay, so have you ever, um, I'm trying to figure out how to put this. Have you ever had like, mm, ah, a piece of music, mm. music, we'll use music to explain this. Mm. Have you ever had a piece of music that just starts off slow and slow and like barely hear it? And then it just continues on the, in the background and potentially adding more uh, connections, more themes, more rhythms, mm. um, more connections, more themes, more rhythms, more connections, more themes, more rhythms in different ways. Mm. Um, and until like 10 minutes in, um, uh, 10 minutes in, it's the full blown uh it's like the full blown like song mm. um and the full blown connection i mean that that's how it was for me um uh, because what what happened was is that they um they waited and essentially waited till i got into a circumstance to where i was able to accept that connection yeah. and to welcome it and take it in and that's and that's the thing about it for me. It's like it it wasn't like I was I was getting started for me was like, okay, I'm gonna go read these things, listen to these things, and like kind of meet some folks, but it wasn't like that that big of a deal. Mm. So and by the time like and so a couple of years after the Alexi reading, um, you know, it's like I'm I'm a regularly practicing person who like has spirits and deities in their life and magic. That sort of thing and like so what you do is you um i end up um having some changes that i need to make i need to move out in the um and i end up having a, like a gigantic task before i leave um and you know and it's like one of those things where it's like that's where the music starts for me is like mm -hmm. when i start the process of leaving new orleans um, in part because New Orleans was a good growing place for me. But as I leave, it's like, I think that that connection starts to build and that mu and the, those music and themes start to build. Mm. Um, I wouldn't say that I got to that, that like heart's soul um, uh, until like probably 2016. Mm. Um, that's when it really happened for me. Mm. And that just happened when I decided to finally let go of some of the old stuff that it was carrying with me. Mm. And as soon as I did that, um, then this new stuff started to come in. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I guess the only other thing about practically getting started, um, mm. I'm looking at my notes here, mm. is um, that I didn't mention is I, you know, it's also like for me, practically getting started was also about building up a network of people, mm. a network of people that you can talk to, confide in, and trust. Mm. And that's important. Yes, very much so. <sighs> so what sort of things do you do on a daily, weekly, monthly, or seasonal basis to explore or express your Irish spirituality? Take us mm. a little walk through and you can pick you know, you don't have to go through it all. Um, I, totally. know you, I know you work very hard. <laughs> um, well, I, you know, here's the thing about me working hard. I mean, I, I want to say I hardly work. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, in part because like, okay, so three things. Well, and I always say three things. It's, it's like, <laughs> I, I, I should, I, even though I may not necessarily have to. Um, <laughs> so, um, is... You know, when I'm very task oriented, like I, and, and so because I have like these, um, 
spirits and deities in my life. You know, it's like, I, I tend to, I, for the longest time, I was like, I'm just going to go live my life. And if you want me to do things, I will do. Mm-hmm. So for the lo- and, and so for me, a lot of this is like a question of, are you talking about the past? Are you talking about now? You know, that sort of thing. And so like for the longest time for me, that, that's kind of how it was. And now it's like, now what you do is you, um, I think it's important to like build a life that is explores and expresses this. Like it's, it's kind of like um, uh, setting yourself up to exercise. Um, it's setting your, it's setting up a routine, mm. you know, it's, it's setting up a life to where you build this in and to where actions that you're taking on the day to day include this, you know? And, and so it's like, and so like your self growth should be tied into this. Mm. Your engagement with the world should be tied into this. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I think, I think, like, I think Christianity had, has given, like, gives you like this idea that um i'll I'll call it the supernatural natural duality and the spirituality life duality Hmm. you know um it's like spirituality is your is spirituality and life are like as if somewhat separate like god and you are separate you know Hmm. kind of dynamic where like and and like well you know in the irish tradition they definitely are still separate i imagine um, well, I hope so, at least. I hope I'm not just talking to myself. No, they are. In, well, when it comes to the Catholic Church, they, they are, to a certain extent, I think that's why Irish Catholicism is a little bit different from mm-hmm. um, other places, because there is a lot more integration than you'd see in other places, which kind of, which could be read as, and often is read as, you know, that, oh, the, the Irish are very holy, you know, they're very Catholic, very yeah. Catholic very devout but actually what it is is the carryover of that day-to-day spirituality which has always been a part of our nature so it's lighting candles and saying prayers it's you know visiting sacred sites whether that's a church or a well or you know wherever that might be wherever is is sacred and wherever that connection is formed um to that person or with that person and that site Mm -hmm. um there's regular visits, there's regular, you know, so that could be a pilgrimage on an annual basis, or it could be literally a daily, a daily visit, a daily, you know, guardianship, taking care of a place, you know. Um, and like I said, that goes from the little old ladies going in and cleaning the church every day to, you know, the old dude who is the one who goes and every morning he opens the, the gate to the holy well and makes sure that there's be no rubbish thrown in and, you know, I actually know at least three guys who do this around the country currently, yeah. personally, you know, and then at night time he goes out and he locks it up again, you know, um, and that, you know, that's how our sacred sites ran for years yeah. as well. The, the house down the road had the key and, you know, if you wanted to get into the mound, you had to, because there's little black iron gates on it, you know, uh-huh. you had to go and you had to, to knock on somebody's door down the road, like, so that kind of integration, I believe is, is a, is a, a folk memory from our our pre-christian and um, yeah. because it, i don't think it's that common in in other places and in other countries you know that the level of the of it that we get here yeah i would certainly agree like and i i think i think also like the the division between the supernatural and the natural mm. you know it's like I, and and that's that to me is like uh, super important because it's like i mean this goes into like uh, what I like to call cosmology, you know, where like the supernatural, like, okay, so uh, let's take the good people. Mm. Um, the good people, they're, they're around, they're there. What are the implications of this for our picture of the universe? Mm. Like, I mean, are they quantum? Are they, what are they? you know sort of thing i mean it's like and and so when you're talking about this sort of thing i mean it's like you know i think we have a tendency to like wall off um and and i see we as in like kind of broader generalized you know sorts of things and like myself and the way i was taught really so when i say we i'm like really thinking like myself and my experiences and like the way in which i was taught 
Hmm. It's like we have, um, I think that there is a tendency to, um, to really teach as if the supernatural is different than the natural. To compartmentalize and, them, exactly. and take them out of the everyday, yeah. Yeah, and and take them out of the everyday and take them out of like, um, take them out of your life. Yeah. Um, you know, which is why but I'm it's, like, it's a control thing as well, isn't it? You know, it's it's yeah. that placement of the priest between the people and their gods, and mm -hmm. that's the biggest difference. And and it is that control, it is that power. Because if you're in charge of your own spirituality, your own comfort and happiness and all the rest of it, then like, what do you need them for? What are you giving them money for? What are you donating for? What are you donating time or effort or whatever? Um, if, you know, if that's in your own control. So obviously that was a problem. <laughs> yes, Laura, why are we giving you money? <laughs> why are you giving me money? I don't know. You must get some value from it. <laughs> Um, but it's that difference between like what I'm doing is is teaching and sharing experience, but I'm not there's not a doctrine, you know, no. there's not I'm not putting myself between like I'm a guide for a reason, you know, I can lead the horse to water and I know the territory and all the rest of it. But the drinking is your own business, you know, and that's between you and your gods. And that like that is a fundamental difference. That is the the essence of you know having that 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 power and that control with with the people and and within communities so that people can get together and take care of each other and that they you know that that it doesn't have to be under the remit of you know uh, a guy who has been given power from rome you know yeah um so and i i think you also don't see yourself as like a sheepdog tending a flock no. <laughs> God no. <laughs> that sounds terrible, Cordelia. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, of cats. <laughs> I mean, I admit confession with 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 uh, priestess Laura might be fun. <laughs> Maybe that's a different website. I need to. <laughs> I mean, you know, twenty dollars. <laughs> One sentence confession. <laughs> Wait, what do I have to do? Do I just have to listen? Because otherwise... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, you just you just take it in. It's fine. Um, and, you know, and, and so when we're talking about, like, these kinds of dualities, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like that kind of power, you know, and so it's like, you need to see your life as spiritual, I think. Yeah. And you need to live it that way. Um, so what this means is you need to engage with the world, you need to uh, learn, you need to you know, have offerings and that sort of like whatever you know that looks like for you mm -hmm. um devotional stuff i mean and mind you like most of my experience i mean i'm pretty overdeveloped with like you know uh spirits and deities that's that's my experience mostly i mean land stuff to a certain extent yes um but I, it's more new to me mm -hmm. and so like i don't necessarily want to like say oh my god like i i know how to do this because i honestly i mean i've only been doing it for i mean i've been doing spiritual stuff for you know more than a decade um but that doesn't necessarily mean that i really know how to do irish spirituality you know and so it's like i feel like i'm way still a student um and honestly i'm really like i i didn't get to say this in the intro i just kind of like but I'm really um, slightly overwhelmed to be included in the August company of the uh, people you've got here. So. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, like just in response to that, I, I'm still a student. I still feel, you know, like I don't think there's anybody who really knows how to do this Irish spirituality stuff. And that's kind of the point of these interviews. And it's it's to you know, as I said to you before, it's to, it's to build a kind of a corpus or a body of experience because mm -hmm. Irish paganism, Irish spirituality is all about individual experience. And yes, there are groups and there, you know, there are um, working groups, magical groups, spiritual groups who work together and that's fine. Um, but ultimately it's just, again, it's, it's, it's me and my gods or, or me and the land or, you know, however you're, you're exploring that me in the other world, you know, um, mm. 
so like there's no kind of barrier for entry <laughs> with these you know you don't have to be doing it for 20 plus years you don't have to be um i mean you don't have to be in ireland you don't have to be uh you don't have to have a fucking pedigree or you know a a a, a cv as long as your arm like that that's not what matters as you know what matters is that daily or you know regularly exploring and expressing that is is that connection you know and, and again that that's what it always comes back for me is how do you connect and you know how do you express that connection to whether that's to a deity or to your community or you know to to youtube hi youtube <laughs> um you know it's 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 important and and everybody's voice matters in this i believe so that's why I'm doing these interviews and, you know, and hopefully they'll go on for years and years and years and we'll, we'll see the patterns when we kind of pull back a little bit, we'll see the patterns in it and we can kind of figure it out in, in, in a larger community scale because that's what we haven't have. And, and that, that, that was taken away from us, you know, like we had, we had a work in religion here that was doing grand. <laughs> um, and like, we're still dealing with the leftovers and the hangovers um, from having that literally ripped away from us so you know um let's try and get it back and you're a part of that as much as anybody else thank you um and and when i'm talking about like i mean and so like you can talk about like you know and okay so one of the things i was thinking about i was recently doing like uh, your irish magic course which is absolutely amazing <laughs> thank <way>. you <laughs> um and getting better all the time <laughs> um, yeah and so i mean one of the things i think i think that like is potentially overlooked as a as a really powerful devotional thing you could do um is learning how to do extemporaneous poetry mm. like literally making up something on the spot and mm -hmm. like learning how to do it mm -hmm. um because it, it's like if you think about so when I talk about like living my life and engaging with the world and like all these other things, it's like I end up kind of doing these sorts of things, um, especially before like this became like such a major focus in my life. Um, so I would um, going through grad school, I I went and I really lost my creative voice, um, and in part because grad school, but in part because of like all the transition and everything else going on. Hmm. And so to gain it back, I ended up extemporaneously creating um, erotica um, on the spot for a erotica reading series in New Orleans. Hmm. And so what this, and I didn't like, just until like really reading this lesson three in, in the Irish magic course, like I didn't really think about it as like a, oh, I guess that's kind of a living my life in an Irish spirituality sort of way, mm -hmm. because I can't think of anything less Irish than that. Mm. <laughs> erotica I mean, in New Orleans. Yeah, that's, that's not very Irish. No, extemporaneous erotica. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I mean, you know, maybe not the erotica bit, I don't know, but the extemporaneous poetry bit, I think mm. it's really, like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the key, like the, the poets were the magicians and the, it, that's the expression of the connection, you know, and yeah. that's when, when that emotion wells up when that, when that, when that flow is, is coming from you, like, that's how we voice it. That's how we, you know, and whether it doesn't have to fucking rhyme or, you know, but it's, it's that flow of, <laughs> I mean, have you seen the Roscada? Um, <laughs> but it's that flow that comes from us that again, you know, that's what's making the connection because from, from my lips to your ears kind of thing, you know, and, and again, whoever you're talking to, um, that's the magic and it's, it's amazing and it's amazing when it happens. It's amazing when it happens in, within a particular community or company or, or at a site or, or anything like that. And I, I think you're absolutely spot on, like giving that space, learning, the, the thing is, though, like it's it's all very well kind of talking about, you know, like opening your mouth and this wonder pours forth, but you have to feed the right stuff in as well. Exactly. So 
that's really important. And, you know, and I'm, there's, there's a whole kind of debate within, I suppose, Celtic reconstruction stuff where, um, you know, it's like, well, there's personal gnosis versus scholarly, you know, study. And I'm like, no, you can't have verses. These two things have to work together, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and that's really important as, as an expression. Well, and not only that, I think, I think it's important, like, and this is like understanding the broader context of the academy, right? Mm. It's like, what is the academy, like, the, what is the scholarly study set up to do? Mm. Like, I, I think, I think, like, I mean, and mind you, like, I did an undergraduate degree in history and sociology. I did a, I did all but my thesis on a graduate degree in sociology. Um, so, like, you know, the academia world, especially like history and especially all these other things, like they don't have the, that, that heart centered, um, you know, uh, and here I'm talking radical fairy language, I guess. <laughs> now, don't mind me. Um, but that, but that, you know, that emotion centered, that core of you centered, like direction to go to, they're just going to propose something random um, that makes sense to them intellectually, mm -hmm. you know, because because what the academia, the academia teaches you to not to engage with the material as your whole self, mm. you know, they're, they're meant, academia is kind of like a, a weird social control kind of dynamic where like they take subjects that ordinarily would be very emotional and then they train you to use this like really obtuse language and at least definitely in the case of sociology, yeah. less so in history, but still, I mean, BCE, why do I mean anyway? Don't I I I hate the bees you think. I'm like, if we're not gonna change the date, why do we have to cover the fact that it's Christian? <laughs> I mean, we're still dating it from you know, whatever the fuck I mean Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean I'm just like look I'm still I'm taking it. It's a small win and I'm taking it, okay? <laughs> that's, that's where I'm coming from. I mean, I just rather us be honest about what we're doing. Yeah. And like, and that's kind of what I feel like about academia, right? Is like, I want, I want them to be honest. Like, I think this works, but I'm not sure. And like, and so it doesn't really necessarily need to be verses, but I, I think that like, and this is where the supernatural natural thing comes, comes in. It's like, if you're not able to engage in, in the, these sorts of things with your whole self, like, then you're not able to like in your emotions, in your feelings, in your body, um, you know, like, you're not able to, like, engage with your creative self would be another way of putting it. Um, then I think that, like, you're, you're, you're going to make up something that doesn't really work and doesn't make us make sense at all. Mm. Um, oh, my God. I, I had, I was reading, um, so, like, for instance, um, I was reading the difference between Morgan Daimler's transition uh, translation of the Tainbo Regavna and the one on Mary Jones's website is so mm -hmm. much different. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and it, you can tell that Morgan is bringing um, uh, their whole self. I'm not sure Morgan's pronouns they them. Uh, they them, yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, yeah. um, you can tell that Morgan, Morgan is bringing their whole self to the to the translation. And like trying to like make sense of it in many ways. Whereas the Mary Jones one is just like, um, I don't know what two furta of a chariot are. <laughs> like, so the Morian's uh, cloak is dragging on the, is dragging between the two furta of the chariot. Mm. And this has been deviling me. And I'm like, what the hell? is furta and i'm trying googling and I, I don't see anything and i'm like oh there's a river furta this must be some weird irish word that they just decided to stick in there as if it was a part of a fucking chariot it um go on could be um i haven't actually looked it up on the place to go for that would be the uh, dictionary of irish language edil.ie okay. um, and you can actually guess it's fantastic because you can go and search and they have digitized um the words but the, the problem is with old Irish there's as we're seeing as we're kind of talking around and um, there's multiple different meanings and 
they are drawn from context because obviously we don't have anybody who still speaks it as such yeah. you know um i mean we have people who have relearned to speak it and that's fine but um you know it's it's it, it's not a living language so um so what we have is the context from the manuscripts, but obviously they're patchy in the way that we don't know if like, so we could have one manuscript fragment that gives this, you know, particular context for fur to say, which could mean like spokes or spurs or something like that, you know? Um, but it could be somebody being really fucking flowery and poetical um, for like, a word that actually meant you know wooden spoons or squirrels or some shit you know yeah. um, and and they just they took that word and put it into this context but because we just have this one fragment <laughs> of this yeah. manuscript that's the only context we have for it so you know even if we kind of even if we came across that word then in in other you know manuscripts or in other contexts like it's it does it mean that or or is it just are we kind of taken from this point and are we basing everything else on that then past that you know yeah so it's it's confusing and complicated well and i just i'm just like translation like at least give me some fucking footnotes yeah i mean i don't know don't, don't mind me i'm like i'm cranky no, yeah, um, no that's fine they, they they weren't big on footnotes in the 1800s <laughs> generally <laughs> and, and the 1900s well no that's not fair some of them were but um but i think you're right in that they had a very um you know this is kind of this is my theory and and let's translate to prove my theory you know this is yeah. my hypothesis <laughs> as opposed to some nice decent german scholarship of the 1800s mm. which um so in which again that shows my uh, classical civilization background <laughs> uh, and and apparently it means for to um and i i'm i'm so sorry about cursing i no, that's okay <laughs> oh come here you've seen the rest of the <laughs> fucking bollocks of you know whatever <laughs> i use sweary um, words a lot sweary words all sorts of sweary words um, but apparently it means between, I think, um, on account of, because of, for the sake of, and so, I, I mean, it, it sort of makes sense. It, the reason why this, like, this really, like, kind of looked at me was because I was like, I wonder, because there's this weird thing about chariot construction in some of the Proto-Indo-European people mm. that's, like, really fascinating. Mm. And, um, you know, in terms of, like, chariots do this chariots do that you know there's a lot of random theories that i i vaguely remember from like more than a decade ago now um and that's why i was like maybe this is a chariot part that would be really neat mm -hmm. um and apparently it doesn't mean that at all and just to throw a further spoke in the in the chariot oh, wheel, um, <laughs> archaeologically speaking we don't have any remnants of chariots in Ireland. <laughs> we have um, we have wooden wheels, we have various bits and pieces which could be from chariots, mm -hmm. but we haven't found um, a chariot as far as I know. Now correct me in the comments there if I'm wrong, all you nerds. Um, and I say that with the greatest of affection because I am one. Um, but yeah, we don't have, we don't have the evidence for chariots in Ireland so there's this like obviously we have the literary evidence from the, the mm. medieval texts but it's referring to a time when chariots were supposedly super common but the archaeology doesn't match up with that now I'm always a little bit suspicious of that of, of drawing any like concrete conclusions from the archaeology doesn't match up because um, Ireland has so much archaeology like you know, just two feet down that has never been touched and, and will never be touched because we don't have the money for, we've, we've so much to explore and we don't have the funding to do that. So there's, there's huge swathes of the country which really need, you know, decent excavation. And, and I'm sure that we would find all sorts of weird yeah. and wonderful things, you know, um, but we just, we don't have the finances in the country to do that, you know, and, and again, there's so much material to work with you'd have to kind of pick your window you know well and i'd be suspicious of any chariot that they're talking about anyway mm. um because frankly uh chariots what's a, okay so what is a wheeled vehicle's natural enemy mud 
Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, I, as you know, I live currently in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I know there, there is a definite mud season here. Mm. Um, I don't entirely, I'm not as familiar with the weather patterns in Ireland, but, um, well, let me introduce you to the concept of bogs. If you're not, familiar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because there's those as well. Um, like in the iron age, which is, you know, what we're talking kind of the height of yeah. the Ulster cycle would be around the iron age. Um, I th- I'm, I'm pretty sure most of like the middle of Ireland was effectively like swampy bog. Exactly. So now I know that we had like multiple, they're called uh, tohers, T-O-G-H-E-R-S, which are these, these roads or routeways that ran across the bogs. Um, so they're, like, there's a lot of evidence of those. But again, you know, you're working with, um, you're, yeah, you're working with very fucking uneven ground here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Even, you know, currently. Although um, there is like, there would have been very well established routeways through Ireland as well though. So, you know, I will kind of put that in where um, there were major, like from, from glacial erosion and things like that. Mm -hmm. So like there were major routeways, which, um, you know, but again, like the the road surfaces, so you're still dealing with kind of muck and, and um, even if it's up out of the bog, you know, you're still dealing with um, uneven road surfaces. So, what kind of chariots we would have had here. I know um, a friend of mine uh, did some experimental archaeology with um, uh, the large kind of wooden wheels that we have found. Mm -hmm. Um, So obviously there were some kind of carts or something, you know, but whether it's a a chariot as such, um, but they did experiments with um, leather straps for like the, the wheels are quite large. So, you know, I know that there was one found um, quite quite intact, actually, in the bog um, up by Corlay Trackway, mm-hmm. um, or that's where it's displayed currently anyway in, in Longford, but I think it was found in Roscommon. Um, and I mean, you're talking kind of like this size of a, of a tread, yeah. you know, so kind of the wow. size of my head. Cool. Yeah, um, maybe, well, yeah. I'm I'm going by memory. It seemed fucking huge when I saw it in the museum. I mean, it was like, yeah. it was big. So between that and like a combination of like, you know, wicker work and leather straps, you could actually make something that could um, travel in Ireland. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I can't see them being common or like the, you know, the, the regular kind of vernacular mode of transport at all. So... Yeah. So I wouldn't discount chariots, but, you know, I think there's definitely some flights of fancy going on in some of the literary evidence that we have as well. Definitely. Yeah. Well, and, and like, so, hmm, to go, I mean, I, I, we digressed. Mm, totally, yeah. <laughs> um, but it, and when we're talking about this, like, I, I think it's important to, like, uh, I think it's important to, like, learn. It's like, I think it's, like, I think one of the things about it, besides, like, hmm, Besides, like, a daily, like, you know, setting aside time, setting aside contact time, setting aside, like, activities, you know, these sorts of things. I think it's important to, like, learn about yourself, about the world, and about the past. Like, I think those three kinds of mm-hmm. areas of learning are, like, super important. Yeah. To, like, really kind of express your spirituality. Like, so what we're talking about right now is kind of like the learning about the past, Mm -hmm. you know, is like putting yourself back there and understanding that the past is incredibly and profoundly different than our present Mm -hmm. um, for so many reasons. And like, especially when you're talking like something as personal and as like, uh, as like the, a spiritual or creative or religious basis, Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, uh, yes, the, the, the lore can tell you these sorts of things, but the lore isn't going to tell you how it feels when you do that extemporaneous poetry mm. and how to like take that, take that feeling and use that and use that feeling to summon it up in yourself. At least I don't think it does. Maybe it does. And I don't know. <laughs> I um, don't think it does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm guessing, but again, because I'm not an expert on the lore. I mean, I know some things, but, you know, um, 
and and I think I think knowing that that emotional and that that like because I think I think when when you're talking about academia, like it it can be really like people did this, people did that, and I think you really need to like put the heart back into it. Hmm. Um, and this goes into like some of the anthro stuff that I really love, um, which I will eventually mention. So. I'm going to leave that there because I want to talk about the, the self growth and like, because I, I think, I think like, and I mean self growth in terms of, uh, in terms of like, sorry. Sorry. No, you're fine. I was just like, what is that? And do I need, to no, <laughs> no, you really don't. It was, uh, <laughs> I, no. My phone flashed and I hit it and it kicked into a podcast I was listening to earlier. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like earlier when uh, I got some Facebook messages and I'm like, oh my God, I should silence my phone. I should stare at it. And, and I was like, wait, I'm on camera. I need to not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Okay. So, so I mean, have you so other stuff on this question then? To try uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting there. Um, I mean, so self-growth. And so I think, I think like self-growth is like super important. And what I mean by self-growth is like learning how to undo like the traumatic stuff that has been done to you. I think also learning how to like undo the toxicity that we've been taught. And also like learning how to, how to be able to take in, um, uh, more of a connection. I mean, that to me is like, and that to me is, you know, huge. Mm. Um, learning to speak Irish, you know, and this is um, learning to like, maybe even learning to speak old Irish, who the hell knows? I don't know if I'm really all that ready for that. Um, but, because I can barely, I mean, I can say do week, and, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. But I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm certainly not able to speak it yet. Mm -hmm. um you know i mean i can maybe read something off and i can probably type something but um so where you start you just have to start that's okay uh, exactly so and and when you're talking about it i mean it's it's also like um and i think that there's like so and then there's like engagement with the world and like daily daily like some sort of daily connection or ritual to whatever spirits um and uh, uh, including the land that you have connection to. Mm. Like, I mean, I think it's a matter of doing, you know, those sorts of things, whatever makes sense for you. Mm. Um, you know, for me, I've got a weekly, you know, I've got a weekly, like, uh, devotion that I do. And that kind of clears me for the week. Um, it's very efficient, actually. Um, <laughs> which, which I don't know whether that's necessarily a good thing. Maybe daily would be better. But um, I know. think if, if you can get away with weekly, I'd be getting away with weekly. You know? yeah. <laughs> What's the minimum of work <laughs> I need to put in here <laughs> so that I'm not going to get smited? <laughs> Look, that's, that's I, the Laura O'Brien approach to. <laughs> I mean, I'm I, I I'm lazy, I, which is why I say I feel like I hardly work. You know, I mean, I mean, I am like, I mean, I will. I will do what need, what needs to be done, but I mean it's I, I don't know it's like that that um, oh I know what it's like. Um, there's that uh, this is this is an incredibly geeky reference. There's that that Star Trek D Deep Space Nine episode where they have a person who's li a liquid, and um, they're a young uh, young liquid being, and they're trying to teach this liquid being that they can change shape. Um, uh, Odo is uh, doing this, the other, the adult liquid person um, who is taught this way. And so what you do is you create an environment that is inhospitable except for this shape that you need to turn into. I feel like that's, that's kind of what happens. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's you know. Um, so yeah, I get away with weekly. Um, I, I, too much envy, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so, and I think when we're talking about engagement with the world, so what, what I'm talking about here is I think 
I think, like, Irish spirituality, like, especially, like, the past, like, 800 years of Ireland, you know, I mean, I think you have to engage with that, um, you know, you have to engage with that history. I mean, especially as part of, like, an Irish diaspora in a, um, in a colonized state, um, where I am a colonizer, you know, it's, like, um, where, but my own, um, part of my ancestry at least, um, was in turn colonized. Um, it's like you're in this interesting position. Um, you're in a position of power in many ways. Um, and yet you're also in a position of like, I have had things taken away from me. And so, um, and it's like one, you know, kind of led to another thing, I, I feel like. And so like, I think you need to engage with that history um, in terms of your actions now. Uh, both in terms of learning and in terms of working, you know, learning about the political. Um, and by I mean political, it's like um, not just like, you know, Trump or anything else. I, I think we're, what we're talking about is like the allocation of, of power and resources within society. Mm. Like, I think you need to learn how to, oh, you need to learn the political and then you need to engage with it in terms of your actions and your goals and you need to bring it into your in you need to bring it in and be better mm -hmm. um and i think that is as much an integral part of like an irish spirituality as anything else yeah i mean it, it i mean it needs to be yeah and it's this it's the system it's the the social and political system that you're you know you're learning about and you're engaging with so i think you know people tend to kind of get caught up in this person or this event in politics or in society and they kind of get stuck there you know or, or a particular party or, or whatever and that becomes the focus you know where they kind of need to maybe draw back and learn how the system works and all the things that are influencing that you know that that moment in time that person that party that that event um because it's only when you see that big picture stuff that you can actually see where the changes need to make so that to stop that happening again, or, you know, to, or to encourage it, if it's a positive thing to encourage it happening again, you know? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, and I think the big picture is really hard because I mean, a lot of your ego is, is at least um, as a North American, like, I think, um, I think a lot of your ego is bound up in, um, and I say North American because I feel like this is uh, as applicable to a Canadian context. Mm. Um, uh, is your ego is bound up in your idea of me as a good white person, mm. you know, or as a good person, period. Like, and I think, like, understanding that as someone who is both incredibly, um, who has grown up in, in the water of white supremacy, and who has grown up in the water of like this sort of like um, imperial, you know, mm -hmm. uh, power. Um, mm -hmm. And this is not, I mean, to a certain extent, Canada, yes, mm -hmm. definitely, but um, definitely the US. Um, and, you know, it's like, you know, those, that sort of history impacts you every day. It impacts the way you think about what you can and can't do. It impacts the way you move. Like, it impacts the fact that I feel like I can make my own schedule and um, communicate in particular ways. Mm. Um, it impacts how I talk. You know, and, and this, this is, and so these all tie in, right? Mm. And so um, I want to go back to your big picture point mm. about cultural appropriation. <laughs> and I, I want to mention my pet theory about cultural appropriation. Mm. And this is um, drawn from somebody I knew back in New Orleans to a certain extent. But like, I think the important thing that people seem to really miss about cultural appropriation is that I think, like, and I feel like unless you get the context of it, like the context of like the broader colonialism, mm. like, you know, it's, it's easy to miss. Um, and I think especially a lot of the media articles and that sort of thing. Cultural appropriation is about denying resources um, and the ability to get resources to colonize groups. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, and so let me break this down slightly. It's like, um, it's, it's about cultural appropriation is about, I, as a white person, I'm going to learn this thing that, um, 
that you marginalize group that is most likely brown. Um, but could be, you know, Irish, and so we could be like I as a, um, as a call as a imperial person in the U.S. Hmm. Um, is going to go by. So I mean, it does apply, but um, I tend to think of it as a uh, as a white versus uh, brown and versus uh, African descent. You know, those two categories. Yeah. Um, not that I'm, I'm I'm getting caught up in my language, but uh, I had, yeah. Anyway person of color, we'll say. Um, so I, as a white person, I'm going to go learn something because it's trendy or because it was, and it's something that was at once banned. And then suddenly I'm going to, uh, and I may be accepted by those folks. And then uh, other white people see me learning it and then want to learn it too. And then suddenly it becomes an industry that they can sell because it's such a great thing. Mm. And that, that commodification, um, is it benefits white people and it benefits like and 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 or benefits the people who the colonizing people you know whatever I'm that looking at you yoga <laughs> well yeah i mean yoga has like uh, there's some complications with yoga but i think about yoga definitely in this context yeah i mean yoga i mean i feel like that there i, I don't like there are some contexts in which I, it is my understanding that yoga does feed into, you know, yoga can authentically feed into brown folks, um, you know, making money, whether or not it's here in the U.S. or yeah. in India. Um, uh, that's yeah. that's where the line for me is, and I think yeah. I've said it before. Like, is is where's the money going? You know? Yeah, um, and and not just money, but I think you're right, resources. Um, you know, there might be no money involved, but um, there could be, you know, publicity or there could be um, whatever, whatever resources come along with um, p- things being popular. And if the money is going to white people, then that's appropriation. <laughs> and if the money is yeah. going to, to native or indigenous creators or communities, then it's appreciation you know and obviously things are not black and white but as a general rule i think that works yeah well and i also think that there's a question of lane too like for me it's like i it's not up to me to police um it's up to me to like you know it's not up to me to like say who among like this set of uh marginalized people uh, marginalized uh racially colonially um, people should be allowed to teach and not teach yoga. Like, mm. it's not my determination to make. Mm. You know, it's like, for me, it, my determination to make is, is this making money by a white person or a colonized person? Mm. And that's, I feel like that that's where my lane is relative yeah. to that. And I mean, I may be wrong, but like, I feel like that, like, if you have, um, like, an African-American or a slash black yoga teacher, like, I'm not, I mean, I feel like, you know, maybe it is. I don't know. Like, this is not as a white person for me to like even talk about. It. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna start. I I would be exactly the same. You know, fucking you do you. Like, I'm not gonna start um, monitoring or policing in any way what uh, people of color are doing or or you know minorities, uh, people who have been put into minority communities or or are minorities. I I don't know if that's a an identifier or whatever, but you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um. But uh, I, but I think you're right though. As as a white person, um, it very much is my job to, um, you know, call out the lady in the Lululemon pants, um, who is, you know, all bendy and yoga and all the rest of it, um, who is absolutely not, you know, who may have studied in India or, you know, under whatever, and is totally just using that back in the United States to make more money, you know, because it's, it's an authentic practice that she has and it's not fucking goat yoga or laughing yoga or whatever, you know, yeah. those are both real things, by the way. So um, you're saying okay. goat yoga and laugh. Goat yoga? Goat yoga. Yes. Like as in goats. But they eat your pants? Um, you go into a barn with the goats and everybody does yoga and the goats get involved and it's... They eat your pants. 
Yeah, yeah, goats tend to eat everything. They eat your hair, actually. Um, they're, they're very fond of hair. I used to keep goats. So, um, really? yeah. <laughs> yes, we had many a goat based emergency in my household <laughs> through the years. Um, oh, my God. Escape artists, so they are. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I've only encountered a goat one time in my life, um, and that was in South Louisiana. Um, yeah. And that was okay. just. They're vicious. Are they? Yeah. Oh god, yeah, yeah. They're 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 like they're like a, a, a cat crossed with a wolf or some you know, they're just <laughs> they're sly, like they're actually sly, but like they're totally agile, so they'll be like up on a wall, like looking at you, or you know, <laughs> climbing fucking fences. Like I don't, I don't know how they got out of the places that they got out of because they're just, yeah. So, um, funny story. My, I had goats before, but um, I, uh, best joke ever. Now, and I'm gonna fuck it up. I know I am. Um, oh but God. I had yeah. on my on my thirty third birthday, I had a a priest and a bishop deliver me two goats. And I made this, I swear to God, and I made this like, this joke on Facebook that I can't even remember now, so I'm after fucking it up already, um, about, um, it comes up in my memories every year and it's like my best birthday present to myself ever. <laughs> because it's just the gift that keeps on giving. But I made some fucking stupid crack about like, being given the gift of the holy goats. Goats. <laughs> Like my thirty third birthday, was <laughs> Jesus was like on. Oh, I don't know, fucking. I do. It was yeah. better. I'm better in writing, okay. But um, but yeah. I mean, yeah. And I, I mean, and honestly, in some ways, I feel like I'm better in writing too because I can actually fucking edit. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Um, okay, we should probably. <laughs> sure, we can move on. Um, so, how important is it to you personally to be in Ireland physically? So you were saying that you'd had one trip here. So do you want to like expand on the difference, if any, that it made to your spirituality either while you were here or since making that connection physically? I mean, I can. Um, mm -hmm. Let me let me go somewhere else first, which I feel like is like the the the, the statement of my interview. Okay. Uh, is I, you know, because I, I think, again, when we're talking about that ramp up, right, yeah. I think that, like, it wasn't very important for me at all in that ramp up. It was just, like, because, again, the music hadn't really started. Yeah. And so, as, like, as we're getting up to this point, um, you know, that trip was incredibly and profoundly important to me. Um, I mean, it, it, I needed it desperately in so many ways. Um, and um so it it definitely caused a lot like and and not only that like i feel like i feel like i understood something that the pacific northwest is trying to create um but doesn't but creates through whiteness it's like there's there's like this fellow feeling in ireland that i think like people genuinely like care about each other and like want to help each other in, in many ways you know yeah um like overall, like I'm not gonna tell you that the guy who doesn't believe in abortion isn't gonna scream at you. What about the baby? Yeah, you know, because um, that certainly happens. <laughs> it, it, yeah, <laughs> um, we've, we've just had many, many months of that. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you, you'll want to fight him, and you know, yeah. Yep, it's had a, many months of that too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and. So, like, I mean, that's definitely still happens, but at least compared to the U.S. Um, and in, like, the past, you know, and the Pacific Northwest, definitely. Like, I feel like there's, like, a, I'm going to smile at people, I'm going to be, you know, relatively like, pleasant. Um, and uh, that fellow feeling seems to be, um, that fellow feeling is something the U.S. tries to create, but I think it's too uh, libertarian and too, like, I don't know. I mean, too class based. I don't. I mean, I feel like that at least the Pacific Northwest tries to create it. Um, I feel like New Orleans creates it differently. Um, so, like, I'm, I, I don't. I probably shouldn't talk about the whole U.S. this way, but I'm going to say the Pacific Northwest um, uh, tries to create that. But then also, like, it it seems it seems like a pale shadow of what is in Ireland, and that's kind of interesting. Um, so that's one of the tidbits. I, I mean. 
And I guess for me, like connecting, finally I'm able to like get to a connection with the land environment. And I think that that being able to like finally get to that point where you've opened up um, enough to do that is uh, super important. So I definitely think that it's important for me to be physically in Ireland, um, at least um, for part of my life at this point. So that's kind of uh, where I'm at. Hmm. Okay. Coming soon in 2019. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. And like when you come to Ireland, do you feel that you're going to like settle here or is it something that you would see as more temporary? I, I don't know. Mm. I mean, again, I don't know what my life looks like. Mm. Um, I mean, I feel like I'm just now getting to the point where I can car carry a beat. Mm. <laughs> you I know, like this analogy. <laughs> thank you. I mean, I don't know. I guess it's because I'm so used to jazz, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and like, I mean, I definitely am thinking about it as a move rather than a trip, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, like, I mean, settling there, I don't know. I really don't. I mean, I guess like, you're going to have to suck it and see. Yeah. I mean, I would like to, but, you know, I don't, maybe there's some other things I need to do. Yeah. Like, if you had told me, like, five years ago that I would be where I am now, I would have not believed it. Mm. I mean, if you would have told me a decade ago that I would be up here. Uh, I mean, I never thought I would be in New Orleans, mind you. Yeah. Like, um, so, like, what my future looks like is, uh, uh, feels, it feels very fraught <laughs> to, to make the, a prediction. Um, that being said, I mean, I would like to. I mean, it sounds nice. Um, I mean, having been there one trip, I mean, yeah, it sounds amazing. Um, but then there are people who do that with New Orleans. Like, they calm down and they... And then they move. And so, like, I mean, maybe I'm that kind of person with Ireland. Who knows? Like, I'm... Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll just have to wait and see. Watch this space. Definitely. So, if you could make every person beginning this path read just one book, what would it be? I have questions for you. I have... <laughs> Go on. Fire away. Um, I'm... Welcome to the interview where we, in where we interviewed Laura. <laughs> I feel like we should interview you, frankly. <laughs> it has I don't been suggested know. before. <laughs> I feel like like this is turnabout as fair play. Like all of us, like whatever seventeen people should ask well, like one question each <laughs> and it make it like a mega interview. Anyway. Okay, so let me let me stop joking. Um <laughs> Okay, so uh okay. Podcast, blog, or excerpt or book? I'm going to go through all of them, but I want you to pick which one you want me to do first. Um, I want particularly book, like, you know, the old fashioned kind of book. Now it can be an e-book, obviously. So, but, well, um, but yeah, I'm specifically gonna, book. I'm going to say, well, and here's the thing. Like my first reaction was an excerpt of a book that is very Roman. So that's what the excerpt is. So theoretically that counts as a book, but it's not really a book. Right. Because it's like, it is, and it's an excerpt. And the rest of the book is like into the weeds. Mm -hmm. um, and it's amazing, but into the weeds. Um, so what I was thinking is like, I think, I think I want people to be like engaging with speculative fiction by marginalized authors. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say this is because like, I think the world is more wondrous than we know. Like, I, I, I truly feel that. And like, I think that when you're talking about, like, I mean, and, and I'm not going to necessarily say which marginalized authors, like, though I can definitely, like, say things that I like. Um, but I think that when you're talking about that, like, and I also, I, I think it's important to, like, let your imagination kind of run a little wild. Um, you know, and I think a lot of speculative fiction helps you do that. It's like, I think you need to like, kind of let your sense of what is possible in the universe, like, um, be open to that. Mm -hmm. Because I think, I think one of the, the implications of like that supernatural, natural, like hiving off of things is that it's like, it's like you can, you can denigrate like 
the other world or you can denigrate like the Irish language or any which has like amazing expressions for um, things of a quote unquote supernatural um, sense that we don't entirely know the meaning of. Mm. And like maybe like and and like I think that kind of training your brain to be like, what if or wouldn't this be cool? Or I wonder what this is like about our actual universe. Like, and I'm not talking about like going and reading Brandon Sanderson or yeah. some fucking bullshit like that. Or like even Tolkien. I mean, oh my god, Tolkien. <laughs> Fuck that guy. I mean, I I unpopular opinion, okay? Like, don't at me. <sighs> That's fair. Um, but I mean my mother loved him, okay? And 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 I, I got enough of and I'm like, no. But you know, but I, I think like like learning to like uh open up your imagination to note to note down what your intuition is saying is true about the world. Mm-hmm. And that I think and that second part I think is so important too. Is like and I think that like speculative fiction and the right speculative fiction can do that. Mm. Um and I'm not and I think the right depends upon the person, but you know, um I mean, yeah. So well, that's this, the book. This question particularly was born from to be perfectly honest, probably from a sense of frustration. Um as an Irish person you know, teaching Irish spirituality or Irish paganism, or even just talking about it, that there's a lot of ignorance and misinformation out there. So that's kind of where this question is coming from, like of me just saying like, if like, I have to interact with all of these people. <laughs> this is my, this is my, my severely yeah. uh, introverted head on as well. You yeah. know, um, I have to interact with all of these people and it's really, really draining on me. Okay. <laughs> so like if I can at least have like a baseline of everybody that I have to talk to has read this book (laughs) like what would that book be so that at least you're guaranteed like a a foundation that is relatable to you so that's kind of where I'm coming from with that I I I I completely understand Mm -hmm. which is why I wanted to give you the options yeah because like a book for me is like what would benefit the most people Mm. Um, yeah. you know, whereas like, I feel, because like, I, because part of me wants to go into like, you know, the political stuff and like, like the, the podcast seen on whiteness, um, which are seen on radio, which has a whiteness series. It's really fucking good. Um, a book called Deep Denial, um, uh, by David Billings and feminism is for everybody, mm. you know, and, uh, the, uh, and the anti-racism training put on by the people's institute for survival and beyond like all of those things i think like all of those uh, like all of those resources like i would love to see people engage with but i don't necessarily have like one of those things that would necessarily speak to somebody and give them the information because again they have to be open to it yeah you know they have to be open to that kind of political engagement in their life and part of because part of what would make my life easier is people learning and people engaging with that kind of with with the history of like racism and colonialism and like and really understanding like how how much denial there is around these particular histories you know it's like i think i think that there is so like you you'll have people like alexei condorzi um, who are trying to create global systems of, like, meaning, um, you know, that sort of thing. And so, like, you, the only, t- oftentimes, like, in that kind of, like, and that oftentimes is, like, what we'll get, what we'll understand, uh, where our information about another culture comes from, is, like, somebody who's trying to create, like, uh, um, Joseph Campbell, for instance, mm. um, Hero of a Thousand Faces, or, um, what's his name? Michael Harner. Uh, uh, core shamanism guy. Um, you know, uh, both of them, I mean, I feel like are in some ways kind of really terrible. I mean, I don't have enough of Joseph Campbell's uh, critique in my head to like really talk about it. Um, so maybe he's less terrible than I know, you know, um, but definitely Michael Harner. And like, 
and when we're talking about these sorts of people, it's like, it's like those are academics who are going into indigenous cultures and like trying to understand about those indigenous cultures and trying to like create universal techniques that they can then uh, publish in academia and use to further their their uh, you know further their career mm. and and when we're talking about this sort of thing like i think i think it's important to like understand how much like our current political system has really taken an awareness of what other cultures um around the world contribute you know yeah um you know it's like the like uh, the banjo you know i mean like the secret history of the banjo is as like an african instrument um you know i mean just like the fucking banjo which like i mean if you go into like any sort of like uh, appalachian music anything like that you know you hear like you hear banjos mm. like maybe i'm completely wrong about that but like i mean or even the guitar which i'm pretty sure and maybe i'm wrong about that but anyway it's like there's so much history of like things that have been taken and are like normalized and then we feel like that they are you know they are now our culture mm. um one of my favorite ones is uh that I just found pretty recently is an article on the chili pepper. Um, and I'm going to put it here in the chat. And it's like a deep globalization. <laughs> um, you know, it's all spicy food is from Latin America. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I think, I think it's like, I mean, and so I feel like that understanding that, that those 500 years of history um, in, that, in that particular case, 500 plus years of history, and, you know, that builds up a lot of shit. And so when, you know, it's like a kind of a respect for that and a, and a willingness to hear. Hmm. And, that, and that would be the result that I would want. Um, okay, but Cordelia, you haven't given us a book. <laughs> I mean, this is all fascinating, but you're prevaricating around. You knew this question was coming. Right? So like... <laughs> just to make your life easier if you had to just like if you had the power to like go into the dolly parton foundation right and make sure that this one particular book was on the curriculum like for kids all over the world who you know well i know that she only does kids but like just for example right if you could give a free book and guarantee that everybody would read it what would that book be um uh, well, I'm, this is where we go into my ex excerpt, which is my first answer, frankly. Okay. Um, and this is the first chapter of the Roman Honor, The Fire and the Bones by Carl Lombardi. Hmm. Um, and the reason why is... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just laughing at the, you haven't given us an answer. <laughs> yeah, you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did answer. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, so is, is this your final answer? <laughs> it is. Um, and, and the reason why I'm going to, it's also my first answer. Mm. Um, you know, and the reason why I say this is because, like, I think it kind of gets to, so it's, it's about, uh, that book is about getting into the emotional life of the Romans. Right. And, like, and, like, understanding like we have so much on the Romans that like it, it's um, it's relatively easy to do, and I think that that kind of like exploration and that kind of like oh they are so different from us, mm. you know because I think I think like uh, our the imperial powers of the past like um, I would say at least two hundred three hundred years like the the British and the Roman and the um, the British and the Americans. Um, have used Rome to like justify their empire, mm. you know? Um, and so there's, there's so much, um, and the Romans were like fundamentally different than either of those two cultures really. Mm. Um, for all that the American founders tried to, you know, kind of create a Roman political system. Um, you know, it, it's like the cultures are so different. And so, and it's like understanding, like understanding that that intro provides like a justification for why do this and what they're trying to do. And I think if you're going to approach the past 
um, and especially like any sort of like spirituality, mm. you need to get to that emotional sense. You need yeah. to get to that creative sense and you need to connect to it as well um, and connect to those ancestors and be like, hey, how should I be living my life? How should I be really feeling about my life? You know, yeah. and this is as much to me as anything else, frankly. Yeah. Um, Cause I mean, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm the best at this. Like I just kind of vaguely see it, you know, yeah. sort of thing. We're all disconnected in those ways. And, you know, again, it comes back to the connection and it comes back to how do you form those connections? How do you build those relationships? How do you, mm -hmm. Um, you know, especially if, if you're dealing with something so far in the past and, and usually so kind of cut and dry, um, it is that, that wider context, that bigger picture, like that, that integration. And yeah, if we could all get there, then that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're working on it. Definitely. So that's the one excerpt. Okay. That's my final answer. Okay. That's your final answer. Do you want to phone a friend? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> okay, so um, what advice do you wish someone had given you that you would like to give people starting out on this path? Uh, I love this question because it's like, there's there's so much that like baby pagan Laura did so wrong, <laughs> hey. you know, and it was just sheer kind of ignorance and not having, you know, just feeling around, fumbling around in the dark and not having a mentor, not having any kind of system in place and um, within our, our society or our culture to deal with what was happening to me, you know? Yeah. Um, and it, it made me very disconnected, which led to a lot of problems because, you know, um, I couldn't, I, I had no, explanation I had no understanding I had no context for what was happening um you know whether that was meeting beings that were you know in my imagination or mm -hmm. wh whatever it was or wandering off into the other world or you know having having experiences that with you know receiving information that I had no business yeah. <laughs> having exactly. at the age of seven or eight you know yeah. um so not having a context for it, not having that kind of big picture kind of connection was, was really difficult. And I suppose that's where that question is coming from, you know, because I really believe in community. I really believe in mentorship. And, you know, besides all my paid work, I, I work very hard to try and be that person that I needed, you know, when, when mm -hmm. I was starting out. So, um, because I, I just, I fucking hate the thought of anybody else being, cut loose like that you know and I know people are and I know I'm you know you can't save everybody or whatever but um but yeah it's a big part of the work that I do and and that's why so that's where that question is coming from so over to you what advice do you wish someone had given you well I, I the one thing I was thinking about is like you know it's it's so easy to like be culturally appropriate without mm -hmm. knowing mm -hmm. Like, I think, I think, I think there's so many resources that are culturally appropriate. Um, you know, I mean, <laughs> even that are not very obviously culturally appropriate. Like, and I, I think, I think that that's one of the things to like, note is like, learn how to spot these sorts of, learn how to spot cultural appropriation and yeah. like, learn how to engage with that. And also like, I mean, and so that's like one big thing for me. Yeah, because I feel really like, cultural appropriation because and the reason is practical actually i mean it's it's i mean avoiding harm to people is important and avoiding you know i mean i, I think that's like super important but uh, from a practical like self-centered approach i think cultural appropriation disconnects you from what what is really who you are and who you ought to be yeah you know um it disconnects you from what calls you in life. And I, th I think that that, I mean, in finding that calling and finding that those things that, that really resonate with you or, um, and I, I feel like that's probably, I guess nowadays that, that resonation is, that, um, what is the term? Stereotypical? Yeah. Yeah. Um, go on. But it, yeah. But it's um, like, just to kind of stay on the, like, 
self-centered and, and I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing either because it's it's where we all start out you know yeah. but to stay on that kind of self-centered track with cultural appropriation you're you're getting the washed out version you're getting the poor relation you're getting yeah. the um the, the disconnect you know it's it's the photocopy of the photocopy of the photocopy because the people who are selling it to you have have only got this you know glimpse through a a dirty window kind of thing you know and they they haven't they haven't been doing the work and and it could be because they didn't have the resources you know and it could be that they have a version of it that's just gotten fucking jumbled up because again because there wasn't mentorship because there wasn't resources but like that's been very giving them the benefit of the doubt for the most part oh look at that light mm. effect i just looked at myself I, on the screen I, 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 I mean honestly it, it gives you a priestly glow <laughs> Like, I feel really, like, honored to be in your presence right now. Like, I feel like I should confess to you. <laughs> yeah, $20. <laughs> 20 euro. 20 euro. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Oh, Lord. Um, yeah, but, but yeah, so, like, you're, you're being sold short as well, you know, and, and if you can, if you can invest your money and your resources into supporting indigenous teachers and you know native forms of the stuff that you that you're looking for that you want to then you're fostering a situation where you're getting the real fucking deal you know yeah and you continue to get the real deal and the more it develops i mean like we're in a situation here in ireland where like we we haven't had so like right i'm always talking about you know support native creators and all the rest of us and there's a lot of people working in Ireland that I can't honestly say are um, are the real deal either because, you know, we are dealing with a post-colonial situation where our own stuff is not good enough. You mm. know, we're also dealing with a situation where we have been fed a steady diet of new age fucking cockamamie shit, you know. Um, so, like, practitioners in Ireland... No, not all, not all of them, obviously. And there is still an essence that um, is, is a very strong connection that I know a lot of people. But again, they, they have this connection, but they, they don't have the system. They don't have the, um, the framework to, to develop that within, you know. And, and that, that's a big problem here. And it's because we haven't had the resources, because we've been dealing with all the other shit, like for the last 800 years, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, still, like our like you know our basic bodily autonomy for half of our population was, yeah. is 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 still okay it's been theoretically granted it, it hasn't come into practical effect yet you know so there's a lot of fights that we've had to fight that you know we just we haven't had the resources time energy money support to develop our own spirituality to a place where you know we can generously and and safely for ourselves offer it out you know so so like the, there's there's a huge amount of problems that are involved in that whole appropriation question that's not just you know don't don't put on your yoga pants and go to 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 bendy jane bendy blonde jane down the road you know um like there, there's just there's so much involved in it and i think that's an aspect and an element and i think as you say you need to you need to learn how to spot that you need to, to go back to the you know looking at the political and social systems looking at the history looking at the context looking at the the heart of the people you know and um, all of those things that we've talked about just in the course of this interview even are all kind of distilled into that that question of like how do you how do you authentically connect you know and 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 how do you find that how do you find those resources how do you support those resources and like how do you know what's real and those are all huge problems like and i'm like for all i'm i'm banging on about like don't be a colonial imperialist fucker you know at every opportunity <laughs> um and calling people on their ingrained and inbuilt attitudes and like it's it's tough because it's people who i mean i have them for fuck's sake absolutely like i'm not saying i'm perfect by any stretch and it's it is this constant process of like you think you think you're okay you think you've kind of woke up and then it's like oh look there's a whole other fucking layer on this shit show you know um so i think you're absolutely fucking spot on long rambly agreement with you there um 
about learning how to spot it, you know, and, and, and seeing the systems. And this is one of the reasons why, like, those, those resources that I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, you know, Deep Denial, you know, the Seen on Radio podcast, that mm. sort of thing. Like, I mean, I think those, uh, that's one of the reasons why, like, that was almost, that was as much of an answer as my excerpt to mm. me. Yeah. Because, like, because I think, like, engaging with that denial really opens you up to that sort of thing. Like, understanding, like, outside of this semi, uh, semi-obvious racism, colonial entitlement things, I think it's really easy to carry the preconceptions of what our Irish spirituality community looks like. Mm. um at least in the diaspora yeah. you know it's easy to like think about like the irish diaspora as like all white mm. and the reality is given slavery and everything else mm. i mean and just the whole fucking caribbean is that you know it's like it's not mm -hmm. and you know i mean and i think irish people are better about this um you know at least um in and in the uh, famous example of mr obama um but that doesn't necessarily mean that, like, I, I don't feel like that us in the U.S. at least have, like, a really good grasp of this. Like, we tend to, like, put our categories of, of our racial categories onto, like, Irishness. Yeah. Um, you know, which is one of the reasons why I think um, Irish symbols are, like, are being appropriated by white supremacists. Yeah. Um, you know, that sort of thing. And, and so... I think when, when you're talking about these, these sorts of things, it's, it's really important. But I, the other thing I wanted to come back to is how do you know what's real? Um, and I think that's the other thing that like when you're starting out on this path, that's like the other struggle hmm. that you're going to have is like, how do you, is like that supernatural, natural kind of dichotomy and like struggling through that and like struggling through what is, what is quote unquote my own mind playing tricks on me and what is not you mm -hmm. know and and like kind of getting your own sense of what the world is like um and i think it's important really to bring in what the uh super bring the, the supernatural in invite it on the couch and have some tea with it or something or yeah. have some coffee <laughs> like invite it out for a coffee you know and like i mean it's like yeah okay yeah. Yeah. Um. I think the, my brain is buzzing. Like, there's a lot here, you know. Um. Which obviously we're not going to fix in a day. And I think I just, I suppose I just want to kind of finish up on that point by saying, yeah. um, because I felt like I ended abruptly. Yeah. No. I. I just. I. I have a lot of like for all my fucking hardline. You know, you can't pull that shit anymore, and you have to you know, you have to cop on to yourselves. For all of that, I have a lot of fucking sympathy. I, I won't even say empathy. It's it's genuine sympathy for the diaspora who have been fed this line of shite, you know, who yeah. don't have access or haven't had access to authentic connection, to to you know, to real resources, to the reality of Irish culture even, you know, that that yeah. they have this like narrow fucking window. And like I'm also very very aware and it's something that comes up every time you know every time I bring this up of like how you know uh U.S. citizens have like they're rootless that they have no um no connection to the land that they live on and that they're that's why they're so invested in in their ancestry you know particularly Irish ancestry that kind of thing um, I know it, it's relevant to other cultures, but I come across it obviously in, in the context of Irish ancestry, you know, and it's almost like that's used as an excuse for like, well, I get to kind of do whatever I want because like this is what's come down through my family, even though my family has a fucking arse ways, you know, mm. and, and we need this and, you know, we have to hold on to this. And, and you know, and while I, I, I absolutely do have sympathy for that because the connection that I keep fucking talking about is so important to me that I really genuinely want to facilitate or guide or help or support anybody who, who will come on a fucking journey with me, you know, to, to, to make those connections. Um, like literally my life's work. Um, so I, that's where I'm coming from, but I also do not fucking accept 
that you know well we don't have it so we we have to take it you know yeah and that's very very fucking prevalent and that's that i mean we've talked before you and i privately about um a sense of entitlement that comes with this kind of imperialist post-colonial mm-hmm. attitude um and i absolutely do not fucking accept that 100 percent. no don't give a fuck you don't have it because your ancestors left and colonized a different land okay and now obviously we're not talking about people of color with slavery and you know there's there but i'm talking your your average fucking white anglo-saxon protestant in you know in connecticut right um this is this is are you very... white irish you're white, white. irish <laughs> diaspora person you're yeah. a white person in, in yeah. America. Yeah, yeah yeah but yeah but like that that wasp culture is actually like tip top of the um like i know that there was the whole catholic protestant thing but that kind of went by the wayside with you know <laughs> once once you were in the u.s like that that didn't seem to matter so much you know and um, so there there's not the same division between the catholic and protestant um, no. ancestry because it all just got kind of lumped into irish you know um this is just my experience obviously i'm talking from outside the culture but i, I have mm-hmm quite significant experience in Irish tourism, which obviously has a huge portion of people coming, you know, to, to explore their ancestry in Ireland and and all that, as well as the teaching work that I'm doing now. Um, So like my professional life for, for over a decade has been um, on the daily, almost dealing with these people, you know, who are coming and that sense of entitlement. And, you know, when you, when you question them on it, it's like, well, we don't have it. So we need it. So, you know, we're going to take it. And I'm like, no, no, you don't get to do that. (laughs) So I did want to kind of finish on that. Like, while I do have that sympathy and like I said, life's work really, really want to help people with that, but you got to fucking do it right. You can't just take what you want, you know? Well, and you got to do the work to pay your way. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think, I think that, yeah and and that to me is like something that is very important like and and i guess that's the other piece small piece of advice is you have to pay like you have to pay for it like and what i what i mean by this is like reciprocity is so important yeah and like um and even if like it's money even if it's like something else like you know um i mean it's it's it is so important and not only like i mean and i think it's it's important to like understand how much like people feel like it's just new age stuff that you should be able to get for free and it's like well you know no you should it's it's an exchange you have to like i mean it it always should be i also want to suggest a question Mm -hmm. um and i don't know if this is something you should ask but I feel like it goes along with the how important is it to you personally to be in Ireland physically mm. is like, how does your, I, and this is primarily for us diaspora folks is how does your Irish spirituality um, impact your relationship with the land that you are currently on? Mm. Because like, I think, I think one of the things that, that, that is like so present in Irish spirituality is a connection to Ireland and the Irish land. And like, I think one of the things about the colonial process is by kicking people off of the land, um, you know, uh, off of their native land and then by inhabiting it yourself and yet also not really creating that land connection because we don't really believe in that. Mm. Um, you know, I think that there's like a huge disconnect there. And I mean, and, like in all sorts of other awful things, um, frankly, because at the same time as you're, you're not really connecting with the land and like removing it, it's uh, indigenous caretakers. You're also enslaving those indigenous caretakers, um, in a, in a, uh, carceral system and then creating a chattel system to where, um, to where other people who are not indigenous to the land are also working on it. Mm. And so it's like, if you really think about think about that fundamental context and the disconnect that comes from that like uh for us like white diaspora folks like i think that you're you're talking about something 
that is a huge deal. Like that, I don't know. I mean, it, I know it's been hard for me. I know it was like, it was something that was hard for me to like figure out. Yeah. Like, you know, and like, I feel like visiting Ireland really got me there in many ways. Um, I mean, I feel like, I mean, the, I was already in, in a good place prior to, um, but I mean, I feel like visiting Ireland really helped me with that. Yeah. And like, I think when, when you're talking about that, and like every person is different so I don't necessarily want to say that it's applicable to everybody but I think that it's one of the more important things yeah and it's only really in Ireland like it's only it's only really my generation who have been disconnected from the physical landscape and now obviously there's been no actually you know I was going to say obviously in cities it's different but it's it's kind of not because even in a city, like it's still your physical landscape, obviously, and you still yeah. orientate off, you know, the landmarks and all the rest of it. But like we have lost that with kind of cars and GPSs, you know. Um, but it's really like, so I'm 40. It is actually only my generation because before, before this, you know, we, we, we walked or we cycled everywhere, you know, uh, or mm. a fucking donkey and cart, I, you know. <laughs> I, I'm not even joking. I, down in Clare, like I had, um, when we'd want to go up to the village, we'd walk down to Hookie's, and who was my nana's cousin, and he oh. would cart up the donkey and take us into the village, you know. And yeah. like as we're going, he's telling us about like that such and such's field, and you know, there's there's different kind of local names um, on on just like tiny little patches of land, you know, that oh. carry the history of it, and and the people are so integrally connected to the land and to the naming of the land. And, and it's, it, it's about right relationship. I think maybe that's what you're kind of touching on. Um, you know, which again, the Irish people have as an integral part of our culture. Like it's so fundamental to us. We don't even think, you know, yeah, it, it's really clear. Actually, if you ask somebody for directions in Ireland, mm -hmm. they will give you directions based on a story you yeah. know so it'll be it's not going to be like go down that block and you know go three kilometers and whatever it'll be talking about what you're going to pass um you know and and you'll even get like even from a stranger you'll get uh you pass such and such's house and and they realize that you don't know who such and such is and you know and then they they describe the house and it's got these big fucking stone lions on the pillars and you can't miss it you know but there's there's always that element of story and again they have a relationship with the landscape that they're describing you know and that's something that isn't as common i mean i'm not saying you don't get it elsewhere but it definitely isn't as common and it, it doesn't seem to be such a part of the foundation of 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 you know other people as it is in ireland and I mean, I it definitely, especially when you're talking about like you know your your um, your white New Englander, mm. uh, white New Englander culture that you were talking about. Yeah. You know, I mean that I I uh, my father uh, my father is from uh, New York, um, and you know it's like in like hearing him and his relations talk about like there in Connecticut, it's like they don't have that. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're like, go down this road and do this thing. And I'm like, I mean, I'm lost out of the second direction. I mean, I can't mm -hmm. remember it. I mean, you know, and it's like a thing. So yeah, no, you're, you're yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I didn't mean to shit on Connecticut people, obviously. I know, <laughs> look, I mean. I have, I have from my childhood, rightly or wrongly, I actually know a lot of like, in, in my current relationships, I have a lot of friends in Connecticut. Um, but what I'm talking about, I'm referring to this particular um, you know, idea that I have from my own childhood, from fucking media, obviously, you know, it's not from whatever. Yeah. But yeah. I don't think it's too far off of like this kind of house in the Hamptons kind of people, you know, uh -huh. with with these like, you know, classy old like or old, ye olde style um, residences, like these big fucking sprawling residences that were like supposed to be the the epitome of like old money and you know, when we were kids, like that was portrayed to us, like the media that we were consuming, 
that was portrayed to us as like these are the fancy posh people okay uh-huh. And yet we're looking at it saying that just looks fucking fake. Now, obviously the media have, you know, obviously it was fake versions of, of real. So I'm, I'm aware of that. But, you know, even now looking at things that, that people think of as like old money, you know, do you know what I mean by that? Like, yeah, I yeah. Do. Um, like it just, it seems so fucking disconnected from, um, from the reality of kind of my experience of what's old or what's, um, what's valuable I, yeah. and I think it's that value it's not it's not a money thing it's it's you know that the it's like the value is placed in in really fucking odd places you know and and mm-hmm. that's that disconnect because you didn't get that in fucking Ireland you know yeah. um so I don't know like the the Kennedys or whatever you know and, and I just I have this fucking idea in my head so rightly or wrongly anyway I'm I'm owning my own fucking biases there um and apologies to <laughs> any <laughs> Connecticut diaspora who happen to be watching this well and mind you like I grew up in New Orleans my father is from Connecticut like right. I think of like the worst aspects of my father's family like, when when you talk about that which is yeah. why I think about it that way yeah, yeah um but I mean again like I mean I'm trans and you know it's like I'm pretty sure they didn't you know most of my extendants that out there wouldn't want anything to do with me anyway so right. you know I don't really I don't really like you know, I I feel as a as somebody who grew up in New Orleans, perfectly fine being disparaging. Of, mm. uh, <laughs> Fair, you have a right to do that. Though. <laughs> I'm an outsider. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, well, you know, I don't know, and I don't. I mean, I think I've known some Connecticut folk who are pretty awesome. So don't don't. Yeah. The same goes for me in many ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I actually think that uh, now that I'm thinking about it, it's also coming off the back of reading that book, um, Waking Up White. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, which was re- like really good, but like there was a lot that was coming up. I mean, she was very much kind of, you know, white versus like people of color, not not yeah. adversarially, but like the the two yeah. different societies, you know. Um and she was very much of that kind of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant up upbringing. So I suppose that's what's kind of brought it to the forefront of my head. That's probably why I said Connecticut. Yeah. But um but there was a lot in that that again she didn't even seem to be kind of fully aware of the like the colonial heritage that was going on there you know yeah. she, she was to a certain extent but you know i'd love to fucking sit her down and have a chat like you know? <laughs> yeah you've know, you more work to do <laughs> <You know? laughs> well yeah. and this is why i love the title of deep denial by mm-hmm. david billings mm-hmm. like and, and mind you like i've skimmed the book it's really good um I've been involved in groups that he's been uh, involved in. So like, I, I, and they highly recommend it. So I'm like, yes, please. Um, you know, and because, because I feel like it really is truly this deep denial. Yeah. Like, I mean, and I'm not going to tell you that like, I'm perfect at it because I'm really not like, I'm, I mean, you know, for all my like trying to fit 301 stuff, like um, into my speech, you know, um, that's just because I see it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that like I'm not uh, in denial about certain things. Yeah, and I think we all are, and we've got like, you know, that's that's what I was talking about earlier. With like, you think that you kind of you've woken up about a certain thing, and then you fucking scratch the surface, and there's there's a whole other layer that you have to excavate, you know, <laughs> totally. uh, because it runs deep. Like, yeah, and and this like. As yeah. if 500 years of history yeah. had, had yeah. happened or something. Yeah. I don't know. I know, maybe. right? <laughs> yeah. So. Okay. Okay. So we have a question in from Orla, who is. Uh, <laughs> My what question? <laughs> Orla is a reader. Orla. <laughs> Orla's um, very much a reader. Um, and she's really interested in. So we had a, an interview with Orla there recently um, as well mm-hmm. on, the, on the channel. On the, yeah, on the YouTube channel, whatever. Um, but yeah, so what kind of spe- uh, spec fiction are you a fan of, uh, author series? So this is where you get to, to deep dive into that. Uh, sure. I mean, maybe. Um, <laughs> so I, I, a small bit of context. I used to be a librarian. Um, uh, so <laughs> yes, what was that reaction? <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and, and, uh, thankfully I wasn't as ranty. 
No, in a good <laughs> way. I, I know a lot of librarians and it just doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> uh, well, the funny thing is, is my great aunt was a librarian too. So it's a very much a familial occupation. Um, yeah, but anyway. Um, so, and I used to do reader's advisory for speculative fiction. Um, so, uh, especially marginalized authors. So there's a lot of things that I loved. Um, in, in growing up in New Orleans and, and living and working in New Orleans, like I, I, there were a lot of ones that I absolutely, that were like, um, that were mostly like Afrofuturists, that sort of thing. So like, there's a lot of them and that, uh, a lot of authors in that kind of space that I'm aware of and I really do love. Um, so one of the more popular ones I'm going to say is N.K. Jemison, um, and, uh, N.K. Jemison is absolutely amazing. Um, you know, uh, every piece that I've seen by her is absolutely gorgeous. Um, is that N.K. Jemison? Yeah, Nora K. Jemison. Okay. Um, I can put it, uh, let me search it because I, tend to misspell Jemison. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I mean, she's pretty popular, so I'm not sure it's like uh, Jemison. Okay, she's pretty popular. So like, I'm not gonna tell you that like, um, you know, uh, she, it's, I'm not, it's not a secret, I guess is really what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, and um, so she's really good. Like, and that's probably, like, one of the people that I would say that I absolutely love. Um, now, I, so I'm going to include this one. Um, so there's an Irish one. Like, I don't know, like, I really want to get into more, like, speculative fiction written by Irish people. And I don't know, I'm really looking forward to, like, the world con in 2019. Mm. Um, because I, I probably should, I really ought to go. Um, and, uh, so, because it's being held in Dublin, mm. um, in 2019. And so it's like, I, I really want to, like, I really want to get to know speculative fiction written by Irish people, but there is, um, and you and I have talked about this before, um, James White, mm. um, who is, um, I think, so he wrote Sector General. Let me give a website or something. Uh, okay, I'll give this. Um, he, uh, I know he's from Northern Ireland, but um, which I hope I'm saying that yeah. he's from Belfast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, mind you, he's a dude. He's born in 1928. It's, mm. uh, you know, it's, it's very much that era. But the thing about it that I love is his aliens and his medical science fiction stuff um because the thing is is that he created this medical science fiction classification um or this medical classification for the different kinds of like um uh body types and uh environmental requirements that the aliens could have hmm. so like kind of like a myers brick number for yeah, yeah. like i i eat this and i breathe this and i need this gravity um, and I mean, I think like, and I mean, he's just amazing, frankly. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of like, I could go on and on and on mm. about stuff that I'm a fan of necessarily. It's really, I like to tailor it to my audience because yeah. again, uh, readers advisory, but, um, well, mm -hmm. if, if anybody is watching this on YouTube later on and you have recommendations for, Irish authors who write speculative fiction, please put them in the comments, especially if they are, you know, women or people of color or women of color or um, LGBT authors or anything like that. We'd be particularly interested, but you know, we'll take cis white dudes as well. Um, <laughs> if we must. <laughs> so um, yeah, please feel free to add your recommendations. Yeah. Um, my my channel has been hit recently with um, I don't know if you saw um, I put up "Don't Be a Celtic Racist" video. Oh uh, my! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> so um, the comments under that video are um, 
they they keep calling me a, like a an SJW like it's a bad thing. <laughs> it's like, nope, this is that's that's actually a very good description of my role in the world. And also, and also I really ought to like shout out to like I really kind of I'm tempted to post the Irish slaves um, podcast episode by uh, Irish Passport. Yeah, because because here's the thing about that and 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 I um, the it's it adds to Liam Hogan stuff in amazing ways. Mm. Like I cannot tell you how much it's good. Okay, TLDR, um, the Irish were not actually slaves. Okay, indentured okay. servitude. Thank yes. You. Um, Thank you. But just for anybody who's watching along who's uh, not familiar with this, um, the Limerick historian Liam Hogan has done, Liam Hogan? Yes, Liam Hogan. Yeah. Has done amazing work on it. Um, he actually has a collection of all his uh, pieces to date, which he's put together in a Medium article. So if you Google Liam Hogan Medium, um, you will see it's all together on that platform. And it's it's a really good collection of resources. But if you wanted to throw that podcast or, or a link to it in the chat, that would be cool. Um, and I'll be putting um, the links and resources, I'll be putting them under the YouTube whenever it goes live on YouTube as well. Yeah. If I and remember. <laughs> 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 but I can go back. <laughs> Remind me if I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wait you mean you forget things oh my god i forget things i do oh my god I'm busy. um <laughs> <laughs> so i mean and I, I there's a lot of favorites of mine you know i i don't necessarily like i'm just trying to think of anything that is really gets to the spirituality in the land mm. um and i okay so i will say this isn't quite speculative fiction but i will say i will say this if somebody is looking for a novel to understand Rome, um, Colleen McCullough is really good. Okay. Um, Colleen McCullough is, uh, I mean, mind you, she has a gigantic boner for Caesar. <laughs> <laughs> so. Do you get like, for as, like as, as a Roman history student, um, do you oh get this? <laughs> <laughs> the same way. I'm going to say student, like ongoing learner, you know, I, whatever. You know, I'm not that. No, but just, okay, somebody who's interested, shall we say, right? Uh, sure. Um, okay. Do you get, uh, I'm not making you a t-shirt or anything, I'm just asking you a question, <laughs> right? you don't have to wear it. <laughs> do you get as pissed off with people having a boner for Caesar as I do with people having a boner for Cook Cullen? <laughs> no. Like question. Uh, no. Right. Um, because Caesar won. Thank <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, Sorry. A bigger, a bigger buttock. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, that and also, like, I mean, I know. I'm um, in, and I, you know, I just think, I mean, I prefer Augustus, um, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, his successor, mm. um, where we get the, you know, the, month of august the month that i was born amazing mm -hmm. oh, right. amazing month I mean, amazing month. i mean i'm just you mean saying. you're a leo i'm surprised i, I am <laughs> i have multiple um, leos in my life <laughs> so but that's the thing like i mean i i think like no um and i think who colin is kind of you know he he always strikes it always strikes me that there's more going on in his yeah. like yeah <laughs> like i think it's really easy to like interpret his behavior as being like this asshole guy who's like doing these asshole things because he's an asshole but at the same time i also feel like that there's like i don't entirely understand the cultural context mm -hmm. like i feel like I'd, i like i feel like that there's something missing from this there is and actually um we did our sitting room sessions oh, um <laughs> was on ku colin being a prick um okay so that's gonna be uh over on john stuff so i'll send you a link whenever that goes live okay. um but yeah there's there is a lot to it and like there's a lot oh do i, I probably don't want to go down a whole ku colin track here <laughs> 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 it's my own fault i brought it up um there is a lot to it and Briefly now. Yeah, briefly. I just, I'm trying to I'm trying to formulate. <laughs> um, 
it's kind of it, it's like a two pronged thing though because there's more in it from from two aspects because on the one side we have um Ku Cullen who is like this this great hero and like so many people see Ku Cullen as this fantastic hero and they don't see any further than that you know and mm-hmm. um, so there's that aspect of it where they don't realize in the lore he was a gigantic walking fucking horror show right so yeah like when you actually look at the stories. So like, that's a whole like first layer that we have oh. to start stripping back from Ku Cullen because he became, you know, in, in more recent Irish culture, he became the, the symbol for, you know, nationalistic Irish freedom. So mm. there's a whole lot tied up in there, which I definitely don't have time to go into. And, you know, whew, um, there's a lot, but besides that, um, you know, kind of romantic spectacles, Celtic revival kind of stuff. Um, there's also then when you look at the lore, there is the, you know, when you start to kind of figure out, oh shit, he was, he was horrible. He was really fucking horrible. Like, and you know, he did, he did some terrible things. Um, but then you have to look at, at the cultural context and see that that was that shift be, into kind of warrior culture. There was the iron age was happening and there's, there's a whole lot going on at the time when his stories supposedly anyway were you know were were taking place um and like that those kind of t- changing times changing epochs you know the whole society was changing so um things were being very kind of funneled into this kind of hierarchical class based you know warrior culture system um which was you know, I mean, we could, we could simplify it and call it a patriarchal versus earlier matriarchal, but it's way more complicated than that. Way, way more complicated. But, you know, that will give you an idea at least of kind of what kind of a shift we're talking about. Um, but like Ku Cullen serves a purpose. If you look at the Irish stories as teaching tales, which they were, um, Ku Cullen serves a purpose. He is the horrible example of what not to do. You know, yeah. so he, he has a function in that society, he has a function in those stories. And he's he's almost like a caricature of of this like warrior ideal as such, you know. So why is that funny? Like, he's like the terrible eighties training video of how not to commit sexual assault. Kukulin <laughs> yeah. could have had a starring role in that. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and probably you know, yeah. complete with porn tash, porn stash. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, but um, um, yeah. So, so anyway, let me let me less glibly answer your Caesar thing briefly, mm. um, because because again, I say because he won, because mm. in that in that encompasses like a few different things. I mean, he definitely existed at a time of great societal change, like a shift from sh- a shame culture to a more conscience based culture, um, uh, which you kind of a more, I hold my own personal conscience, whereas the community is going to shame me, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so, and, but the thing is, is that because, because he won the political battles in context, like a lot of the history that we have is written pro him or by him mm. or by his successors. Mm. And so we don't get, he's not the anti-example. Yeah. He is the autodidact who saw the plight of the people um, because he lived among them Mm -hmm. and came in and saved them. Um, So he's, uh, to to use a modern political uh, context, he's like Huey Long um, (laughs) for South Louisiana. Right. Um, You know, uh, so that's, I mean, and and which, you know, I mean, it's a thing. Um, Thank you, white savior Caesar. (laughs) Pretty much, though he predates whiteness, but yes. And also, like, I guess the other thing about it, too, is that, like, a lot of the history that we have of him and the valorization is, like, um, we're going to use his example to build up our own empire, Mm. you know? And so that's the other, I think that's where the boner comes from, and, like, I get it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think, you know, again, we're looking we're pulling back, you know, we're doing what we've kind of advised people to do where we're pulling back and looking at things in the context of the political and social system. And, you know, there we are yeah. Yeah. walking our walk. <laughs> um, and it's important. And you can see the difference then, you know, you move from, 
sees her as this image of one thing and then you get the context for it and and he becomes this you know something else potentially and the same for Cucullin and you know we have to look at things that way we have to look at whether it's modern or, or ancient history we have to look at things that way you know yeah okay so um I'm going to finish up if unless you have anything else that you want to touch on I mean I, I'm still waiting for my confession <laughs> I have paid by 20 euro <laughs> you have not paid 20 euro <laughs> I gotta get an email when I get off the <laughs> Cordelia's PayPal you 20 euro with an SSL certificate <laughs> um, uh. <laughs> no, right well, i'll take your confession privately okay yeah. we don't have to do it on camera <laughs> but i have to go and get but there's so much fun that way <laughs> well would you like uh, to confess uh no i've lost I my not. i've lost my um i know you've uh, lost your glow down <laughs> we've we've lost the moment is gone it's oh gone. my lord ruined ruined okay until so. next year <laughs> How can people best get in touch with you? So I have yeah. a via email at yeah. Murphy at pm dot me. Yeah, that's probably the best way. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, for folks who are connected with your Facebook stuff, I mean, Facebook works too. But yeah, I mean, honestly, email's probably better. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So you're in the Irish Magic and Spirituality Facebook group as well. I am. Um, and and I have made a total of two comments. Yeah. <laughs> you're grand. <laughs> It's fine. Okay, so thank you very much for your time and for coming on with us. Um, and just for anybody who is following along, this is obviously all free content. So if you'd like to support this work, if you want to buy me a pint or a cup of coffee once a month, you could go. Or confession. To, or confession, yes. Um, that's not included in your Patreon rewards. I have to put a separate confession reward on Patreon. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not doing that. Um, <laughs> if you'd like to support this work, you can go to www.patreon.com forward slash Laura O'Brien. And it's very, very much appreciated. Okay, so thank you, Cordelia. And thank you for having me. You're very welcome. And I will talk to you soon. Yep. Okay. Take care. Sloan. Bye. Bye.